This episode of Earl Grey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. This is Dwight Schultz. I played Reginald Barkley, otherwise known as Broccoli, on Star Trek Next Generation and Voyager. You're listening to Trek FM. Theo Gray Hot. Welcome to another cup of Earl Grey, Trek FM's dedicated podcast to the next generation. I'm your host, Justin Ozer. Join with me today are the highly anticipated Amy Nelson and the jumping, jubilant Joe Keegan. Amy, how are you doing today? Hello, hello. As of this recording, we have just seen episode one of Picard and it was so amazing and we had some watch parties. I know you did, Justin. I actually went to two, one on Thursday and then one on Friday. So, and had some wonderful Chateau Chateau Picard wine both nights. Oh, you did drink some. Yeah. Okay, nice. Very, very nice. Yeah, Yeah, as you mentioned, we were talking about before we started recording, I had a watch party at my house. This is the first time I've ever watched a Star Trek premiere with somebody other than my wife. So we had some friends over. Some of them had seen very little Star Trek, maybe not even TNG and other people had seen a lot. So they all really enjoyed it. I love the episode. I've watched it a couple of times. And uh, it, and we had hours of discussions afterwards about Star Trek and various things. So it was wonderful to get together to do that. So, so Joe, how was it uh, at your place? Uh, hi, Justin. Um, yeah, it was good. It was just the two of us. We watched it, watched it again, then listened to it on the way to work. Just because I like oh, to do that. Just listen to the, the just, audio. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, was tempted to actually watch it on the way to work, but... That wouldn't have ended happening. Um, you were driving at the time. I know, I, think. I know. Yes, <laughs> and I don't have Listeners, this fancy self-driving do, car do, yet. Do not w- like watch stuff and drive at the same time, please. Mm-hmm. Audio is yeah, fine, no, but yeah, so, not video, please. <laughs> yes. Um, so that was good. Then came home on Friday and watched it another couple of times. So I think I've seen it maybe six times in total. Oh wow. Amazing. Yeah. I've only had time to watch it twice because we had our watch party on Thursday night, and you know we kept talking for a while and then I had to wake up really early for work. I worked all day and then like I made sure to watch it like during my lunch break because I work from home and then I had to record the line last night. Hopefully listeners you've listened to our (laughs) discussion on that which should have come out about a week ago. Um, But uh, yeah I've only had a chance to watch it twice but I'm definitely going to watch it more. I just loved it. Love the theme song and the credits and Mm. like everything that happens in the episode so very very exciting. So, guys, let's talk about one other thing that's Picard-related because it absolutely Mm -hmm. relates to this show, which is just before the first episode of Picard dropped, Patrick Stewart went on The View, which is a very popular daytime TV show here in the U.S., and Whoopi Goldberg is a co-host, and he asked her on behalf of, you know, the producers and all of that to be a part of season two of Picard, and she said yes, and listeners have seen the video it's 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 very moving <laughs> because yes. uh it, of everything that happens in there and how happy she was about it so this is really exciting news guys we're gonna see Guinan again can you believe it it's wonderful i saw the video and was just freaking out i mean i had lots of people sending it to me you know because they know i like star trek yeah and- joe sent it to me first and i was in a work meeting and i was like oh my god and i can't do anything about this for an hour until this meeting <laughs> <Yes>. ends <laughs> my cute mom sent it to here. me yeah, The View, I think, is just a U.S.-only show. Yeah, yeah. but it like, yeah. went crazy on social media, so invariably yeah. made oh, its yeah. way all around the world in a matter of no time. So, super yeah. exciting. So that was very exciting. I've been so looking forward to possibly seeing Guinan again. And Guinan is also my wife Rosie's favorite character in all of Star Trek, so she was super mm. excited. So, guys, I think probably in a couple of weeks we should do an episode focused on Guinan, badass Guinan moments. How about Yes. It? Let's yeah. do it. 
Mm. Yeah. So listeners, you can look forward to that and think of your badass guy in moments as um, you think about that topic. So it's exciting. And we will talk about Picard related things on this podcast because it is very much building on what's on the next generation. But in our main discussion, we'll continue to focus on you know, episodes and things related to the next generation. But just so you know, um, we may get into things that relate to Picard because it's the same characters and what happens later, and that may inform our discussion. So um, if you haven't seen Picard at this point, we're up to episode one. There may be possibly spoilers for that, depending on what happens in our discussion. So just wanted to, to give a warning on that, and we'll probably do that going forward because I think it'll add to what we're discussing here while we still focus on the TNG, right? Yeah, but... Now watching these TNGs and just having the, you know, knowledge of what's to come adds Mm -hmm. another layer of complexity and intrigue to what has already happened. So, yeah, yeah, watching this episode that we're talking about today, just it's a whole nother level. You know, it's so interesting to to go back to these older next gen episodes. So this is very, very special. It's like you've yep. been in the future when the the characters haven't yet, right. and you know yeah. you know their mm-hmm. future, and you know, yeah, you know it all. Yeah, That's so exciting. Yeah, I want Absolutely. to talk about Picard more. Let's talk about Picard. We'll just I a little know. bit more. Come well, on. you know, what we'll, we we'll, Joe, we'll we'll ration it out. We'll have little bits of Picard at the at the beginning that we that we talk sure. about. But okay. you, if you want to weave something into a conversation, that's cool. Or or have like an, an extended bit that you talk about it in the closing section up to you but let's actually go to babel conference feedback for earl gray 308 that was deleted scene season five uh so amy you want to kick things off yes paloma bennett writes i want to keep the deanna and wharf scene first any scene with deanna troy is a keeper in my book plus i love deanna and wharf's friendship but i don't get their relationship in the seventh season and i don't think this scene supports their pairing Well, I just love it when listeners love Deanna Troy. And yes, any deleted scene with Troy is a keeper. So thank you, Paloma, for your comment. Uh, Yeah, and we should add that both you and I, Amy, really like the Troy Wharf relationship. So um, I think we'll maybe disagree. I know a lot of people don't like that that relationship. And you and I think uh, also added to the outline here, Michael Bennett had a, a reply to Paloma. Did you want to read that? Oh, yes. And so, yeah, Michael writes, yes, I always think that their friendship is rather touching and believable, while their relationship just seems unlikely. Dax and Worf in DS9 is much more like it. I'm probably not saying anything at all controversial here, though. Well, yes, we definitely, I love the Wharf and Dax, and that is the true relationship, but I still like the little flirtings and maybe hints of possibility in TNG, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, Dax and Wharf is the best. I think it's one of the best relationships in Star Trek. I definitely agree there. And I think it's one of his true relationships. I think the other one is with Kalar, really. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's interesting to mm-hmm. to think about. So... Your thoughts, Joe? I'm kind of with Paloma and Michael, and that I think they're just. I know this. The saying is opposites attract, but I think they're just so different that it just seems a bit weird, and it's almost like they've been together for seven years. So, and we see TNG as a family, so any getting together of them just seems a bit awkward because they're almost like brother and sister, almost hmm. kind hmm, of in maybe. a way. Maybe we'll disagree. Actually, yep. there is yeah, no, there, there's a Troy Wharf scene in this episode we're going to talk about. Yes, today. <laughs> we can get into that. But yeah, thanks for your comments, Paloma and Michael. So we have uh, Chris Trebuzio. So this will be an interesting one because he basically just sent some uh, some gifs. <laughs> so what? Or Justin. GIFs. Okay, thanks. sorry, Joe. <sighs> some some moving images. All right, let me put it that way. All right. <laughs> I know Joe chastised me on this before. Mm. So, so basically, uh, Chris put one of a uh, a sheep saying, "You're welcome." Um, Sean the sheep. <laughs> is that from Sean the sheep? Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, and that had to do with uh, Chris replacing Amy's um, season five. Blu- yeah, season five, disc six, Blu-ray that 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 broke. Um, <laughs> and then Joe in the episode had. Um, had talked about the Tesla that he got and, and was joking that uh, he wanted Chris to buy something like that. Uh, and Chris said, I don't have the money to give you, but I have this as I envy your new purchase and 
you know, image with little girl angry and shaking a hairbrush. I mean, how else can you describe it? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but True. Anyway, but we have fun like that on, on the Fable Conference. So, so thanks, Chris. No. Joshua DeVries. I took this one because I really like the surname DeVries because it reminds me of June and Piter DeVries, who's a bad mentor. Um, so Joshua DeVries says, I loved the episode. I really wish the Blu-ray sets included and extended the first duty with the scenes added like season two did for Measure of a Man. The extra scenes are wonderful. Thanks for your comment, yeah. Joshua. Um, I think we all agree that we love the deleted scenes for the most part, and they really should just add them all in, kind of do them all up, put effects in, um, don't have a woman screaming at a replicator, replace it with something better, um, yeah. and give us the full episode, not limited so, to 45 minutes. So, Joe, this makes me think of something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it might be possible with some future technology to have something like a Blu-ray or something like that where you could actually interact with it and you could be like, here's the episode, here's the deleted scene, slot this one in here and this one in here, and I want to watch it and see what it's like. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure CBS, now Viacom CBS might not like you just putting, mashing things together like that, but I think it would be pretty interesting if you were able to mm. do that. Like, oh, I like this deleted scene in this. Let's see what that's like. Oh, maybe not. Let me take that one out and watch it again. Um, lots of possibilities. I think that's... Maybe in the future? Uh, not even in the far future, in the near future with okay. machine learning and AI having an ability to read the source material and extrapolate some kind of other information from it. Um, I don't think you even you need will. even need AI. It could just be like you have a program where it's like, here's the episode and you just like drag and drop stuff together and just watch it. <laughs> well, it's sort of okay. like what we do editing our audio. You know, we yeah. just slide it over and drop something in. That would be great. Video editing is a little more difficult, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, anyway, just an interesting thought. And yeah, I, Joshua, I'd love to see that too, because some of those first duty scenes were, were pretty interesting. So, all right. So let's get into our main discussion where we are talking about the episode, The Most Toys, which is season three, episode 22 of TNG. And just as a brief summary, this is the one with, with Kivas Fajo, the guy who likes to collect things mostly by stealing them, it seems, for his collection. One of the things he does is he contrives this whole plan to make the um, Enterprise crew think that Data has died and he's kind of keeping him prisoner as part of his collection. Um, and then it, it kind of goes through what happens with, with him and, and Fajo. And toward the end, there's this question whether he was going to kill Fajo. So I think it's a pretty interesting episode. It was interesting to rewatch it. But let's start with initial thoughts. So, Amy? Want to go first? Sure. You know, when we decided we were going to talk about this, I mean, it's just one that always comes to mind. Like, you know exactly what it is. It's not forgettable, at least for me. And, right. you know, I was telling my brother, I'm like, hey, I need to watch The Most Toys. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's this one. I'm like, yep, that's exactly what it is. And he's like, that's one of my favorites. And so it's definitely one that I think most people remember. It's not one of those that, now, which one was that? So I like that. And seeing the uh, intrigue on his disappearance was very interesting and like how passionate and, and perseverant Jordy was. Uh, and I know we'll get into it later, but that I had forgotten uh, how much Jordy wasn't letting go. And like, you know, Picard and Riker are like, well, you know, that's just Get how it is, you know? <laughs> and so that was, I was like, I had forgotten that part of it. And so I just, I, I really do like the episode and how it sort of plays off the moral issues of Data's programming versus like humanity morals. And, you know, it's just, it's a very well-written, great episode. Okay. Joe, your initial thoughts? Yeah, it's a really, in addition to being well written, it's really well acted as well, um, with the addition of Saul Rubinek, who plays Kivas Fajo. Um, I've always really liked this episode, and I think I've discovered recently that I really like it when TNG does a mystery, like The Chase or Clues. There's some puzzle to be solved, and it takes the whole team working together to kind of get to the solution. Um, and I think it's a perfect example of a mystery that has to be solved. I do think it might have worked better if they didn't see you data being disabled on the shuttlecraft in the beginning. I think it would have worked better if he just got in the shuttlecraft, left, then exploded. As a viewer, kind of, that tells mm -hmm. you that, oh yeah, data's going to be okay, because why did they disable him just to blow him up? 
So, um, but yeah, I really love it. It's a cool episode. Yeah, like, so for, for me, actually, for a long time, I had some issues with this episode. I think there's a lot of good things that are going on, but especially with the ending, I had some issues with the possible implication that Data was actually going to give this guy a painful death, even for everything that he's done. It didn't seem to make sense, with, and we'll talk about it more. Mm-hmm. But like this time as I've rewatched it, I can kind of see more where it's going for and, and, and be really interested in kind of the moral dilemma there. I did want to make one one note because, and, and this is sad actually, so um, Saul Rubinick plays Kivas Fajo. There's nothing sad about that. He's a great actor, but... Originally, a British actor, David Rappaport, was supposed to to, uh, have taken the role, but he attempted suicide over the weekend a few days before filming was completed, so they had to scramble to get another actor. Um, And there were actually uh, some... some, uh, Actually, sorry, a few days after a few days of filming were completed. So they actually started it with this actress, so they had to refilm those sequences with, with Saul Rubinick. So... But I always uh, find that kind of a sad story. It was supposed to be another actor, and and uh, he tried to commit suicide shortly after the episode aired. But uh, let's talk about Kivas Fajo. So because he is a big focus of this, so he's this. I think we're told Zybalian trader. It seems like he collects things and and steals things, and he doesn't really seem to have much morality at all. He just wants to get what he wants for himself and he keeps the people on his ship um, in fear of him. So I just want to get some thoughts on like Kivas Fajo as, as a character and, and what you think of him, Amy. You know, he plays the foil perfectly because we have Data who is so by the book and his moral programming. And so, and then we have, you know, Fajio who is going to be the exact opposite and just how flippant and nonchalant he is of, yeah, well, you know, you get used to it and you don't worry about these, you know, moral difficulties. You do evil stuff. Oh, well. (laughs) You know, as long as it's the benefit for you. And I like, you know, how he is so logical, but yet without morals. And it's like, wow, that is an interesting Mm -hmm. trait. I mean, I'm not... you know, saying go do that. But it's just interesting to see how well that the writers were able to highlight his logical thinking processes and how he can debate in his, you know, verbal debates with data, you know. And I I just thought that he is so interesting as a character to play off of data because he's not stupid. You You couldn't be a stupid person you know, to go against data. And so I think they just did it mm-hmm. right. And he has all the technology, like that proximity, you know, Yeah, defense. like this little shield around him. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, he's brilliant. He has he's thought, thought of, of everything. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we'll get to it later, but it's, it seems like he's thought of everything except the one thing that happens at the end. But but it, it yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned logic because I hadn't thought about it, but, but you know, you, logic can be used to justify anything. What's important is the combination of logic and what your end goal is and the possible means you would take to achieve that goal, right? Like if you have logic and you're like, my goal is to have the most stuff and have a lot of power. I don't care how I do it. You know, you can use logic any way you want to justify that. But if it's like, my goal is to live the best life I can and try to benefit others when I can and there are X, Y, Z things I will not do in order to achieve that goal, then you can use logic to kind of find your way through that. But like, it's the combination of those three things together that tell you what your actions are and what it's you're capable of doing, not logic itself. Right. Yeah. So, so when you lose one of those, as you said, Mm -hmm. then you end up with a Vagio. Because you could also have like, okay, I have this, this great goal or benefit in mind and there's certain things I won't do, but I'm going to be completely illogical about it. I mean, that could lead to some bad consequences as yeah. well. So, yeah, yeah, that's quite interesting. So, Joe, your thoughts on Fajo? Okay, I don't know about the whole him being logical thing. I think he's more of a complete psychopath. He's got some really unusual eccentricities about him. He does, but sorry, let me just challenge you on that because I think in his mind, it's logical to say, 
I want to have power and things, and I'm going to do whatever I can to achieve that, and I'm going to do this, this, and this in order to protect that and make sure people don't. I mean, I think his his goals are terrible, and he does a lot of bad actions, and maybe he is psychopathic, but that it's it's weird. But that doesn't mean that he's not feeling like he's logically doing what's yeah, needed to okay. achieve his goals. <laughs> I think there's maybe a difference between justifying it in his mind and it mm. being logical. If but by whose standard sense, of logic? Well, there's rules that govern you know, the rules of logic, isn't there? Aren't there? So, yeah, but you have to agree um, to all the assumptions that go into that. So, so there's something <laughs> that data says about him being programmed to use deadly force in the cause of defense. Uh-huh. And Kiva says, oh, shame on you, how casually you, um, you accept your role in murder. Um, and then Data replies that I would not participate in murder. Perhaps you misunderstand. I think what Kivas Fajro does is constantly change the goalposts of an argument so that he can come out as the, the winner. I think he's also trying to test Data and see what his limits are and what he's capable of. So he's mm. asking all these changing questions to see who he is and how, mu- how much of an adversary he'll be and how likely he is to be able to keep yeah. him imprisoned, I think. He's trying to like get in- information. Yeah, and when he can match Data's brilliance um kind of intellectual brilliance he becomes malevolent really easy easily so you'll see him being a bit frivolous and fun as i've all look at my collection everything's amazing and then data fails to um follow his orders and he abuses data essentially by throwing the the phenol plaque on him the 100 yeah, to dissolve his uniform plaque. yes and then he threatens his first officer woman whose name I can't remember. Um, Varia. Varia, yeah, threatens her with death. He's obviously abused his crew. Varia's um, scarred on her face. Um, he's got some really odd vocal tics and he re- repeats words occasionally. Hmm. So when he first addresses Data um, after entering the room for the first time, he says, it took great effort, effort to bring you here and then repeats the word captive. So... He repeats the word effort, then he repeats the word captive, which is just seems really odd. He also makes a couple of wee clicky noises and snaps his fingers a lot, which I thought, I think it's just the way Saul has interpreted it. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that much. I thought it was just kind of his flair for the dramatic, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, an eccentricity. Well, at the beginning, I just thought he was trying to speak slowly because he knew Data had, you know, been short circuited. I mean, they did that to him. So Mm. I sort of felt like it was him trying to communicate to Data, not knowing where his synopses were at the time. Mm, Okay. I just came across his odd behavior. But I like his snapping because it sort of gave him this flippant you know, nonchalant to his yeah. character. Yeah, he yeah. does it when um, Picard requests access to their sensor data. Yeah. And he like, just does a wee yeah. point, point. It's yep. like, like make, it's his make it so, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, just sort of very flippant. Uh-huh. Great character. Um, I think he's probably worth studying in psychiatric terms. Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But Saul Rubinek makes that character. Yes, he does. And I think it looks better with him being kind of more human than David Rappaport's character with all the alien makeup. I think he's a oh, little so you've bit seen, more you've intimidating. you've seen pictures of what that looked like? Yes. I think they, they did that because David Rappaport was really, really short. And so they had to give him uh, something to fear. And that was alien looking makeup. And David Rappaport, of course, was the leader of the, the group and the Time Bandits, the, the, the dwarves. Okay. No, I see the photo. I don't know if you see it on Memory Alpha, but I'm also reading further. And we had mentioned before that David Rappaport had attempted suicide a few days into filming. I, tragically, he actually did commit suicide a couple months later, shortly before the episode premiered. So, yeah. goodness, that's, that's very mm. sad. But yeah, I, I see the picture in it that definitely there's there's more prosthetics on his face for that. It would have been interesting to see what that character would have been like. Or even oh, seeing I see Amy. that now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Anyway, listeners, you can look it up on, on Memory Alpha uh, for the most toys under the background information section. And then if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll see it there. Oh, I um, just did Google Images, David. Oh, Rapport. well, you could do that too and it'll yeah, come up. Yeah, it popped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like it's... It, it is an interesting point because what Saul Rubinek does, it's very distinctive and 
clearly he had very little time to prepare. <laughs> so he probably just saw it and he was like, all right, I'm going to take from my, you know, database of stuff I've done before. And okay, I think this will work, you know, but it, it, it does work pretty well. And because you get to, because I think sometimes it can be more frightening if someone isn't just like, you know, growling and shouting and all evil. But if, if sometimes they seem like, a little bit reasonable or just just a little not taking things seriously and mm. then like all of a sudden they'll do something like you know vaporize someone you know like whoa that seemed to come out of nowhere so i think it is it is pretty uh it's pretty frightening like how amoral he is and how he just kind of goes between just being casual and trying to make jokes and then doing something pretty yeah. sinister yeah i was gonna say which leads to <laughs> Yeah. his ruling by fear, right? Yep. Um, and it's interesting. I find leadership styles and how one leads uh, very interesting. And when I was host of The Edge, I have done actually a couple of episodes on command styles and leadership mm-hmm. styles. And, you know, especially talking about Lorca and then comparing and contrasting that with Pike. So... I find it so interesting, and Faggio does a great job in recognizing all the things that you have to do to rule by fear. Like, I find him very logical, and he's going to use every means possible. And like when he's talking to Data, he's you can see in his mind, he's like he's gathering information because you have to know your enemy to prepare and to anticipate what their actions are going to be. And... He looks for motivations. Like when he talks to Varia and was like, oh, I found her and she was barely an adult. Thankfully, they put mm-hmm. that and not a child. Um, yeah. And I have, you know, fulfilled her every wish and dream. Like he knew her motivations and what she wanted to do. And in his twisted mind, he thinks that he has fulfilled that. And so that's why she is going to be loyal to him. And mm-hmm. I don't... You know, I just, I find that so interesting. And I think you can see that with everyone that's on the ship, like at the very end where he's like, well, I'm just going to keep on killing. So your only option is to, to kill me. And he, you know, points to that, you know, crewman, I'm going to kill him next. And then he, you know, snaps his finger and he goes away, you know, but I, I find his ruling by fear. He thinks it's the best method for no one to, you know, uh, overpower him yeah for him it's kind of like the best method in order for him to get all this stuff that he wants Mm -hmm. and not have other people take advantage of that um i mean he says that he's providing for what everyone needs but we don't even know what that means or what he needs to do in order but like i think there is like one way that he's not logical about things because he's taking a big risk i think in trying to get data, blowing up this shuttle, contriving this thing that they eventually figure out, right, when they actually get to the planet. But it's kind of like in the end, this is the one thing where he's he's gotten someone that he or something that he can't control because everything else that's in the room is an inanimate object or it's, you know, an animal in a cage that can't like physically get out. But for for data, he wants to have this you know sentient being as something to show off to other people right so he's like taking it to the level where he's taking a huge risk that he hasn't before which i think is pretty interesting and i wonder why that's why he wore the the force field just was that just for data because remember he says Mm. that um it disrupted positronic fields yeah i think that's just for data Yeah. yeah just because he knew he might get some resistance because he controls his crew through other ways i suppose he does but it's it's like he can control them through through fear but it's like in the end he goes too far because you know Mm. he's threatened varia with like a painful death and after that she comes back and she's like i want to help you now (laughs) because this is just too much if this guy is willing to just like kill me just because he wants to get something so um yeah it's like the the ruling by fear i think can work up to a point that maybe someone takes it too far and ends up ends up getting resistance because of it um and it actually made me think a little bit of the the guy from gambit two-parter where like Mm -hmm. they're on the pirate ship and he has this thing that controls people and like that works well enough until there's you know this actual resistance to it or they find out things aren't as they seem so it's like ruling by fear can get you to a certain place 
but I think oftentimes like in the end it's not going to work out or you push it too far whereas if you're doing something different which is trying to actually treat people well and to gain their loyalty by being fair and all of that that can be a lot more long lasting but yeah but history has always shown that ruling by fear works up to a point before the villagers yeah. or the townsfolk then have had enough and revolt and kind of hang you out to dry or chase you out of town and like there's loads of examples of rolling by fear look at the news just now there's rarely ever any good news on the national news it's always i have something to say about that joe Uh, sure on you go Uh, so the opinion that i have is the reason that you see so much bad news is actually because something gets into the news if it's unusual or sensational and i think there's lots of little pieces of good news just human interactions that happen every day that aren't newsworthy i actually think there's a lot of good things that happen like many, many times a day throughout the world Mm -hmm. that aren't newsworthy because they're so common and because they're like smaller scale like that. And the bigger things that that make the news are the terrible things that make the news. They make it because they're unusual. So I think we tend to focus sometimes like, oh, see on the news, there's all these terrible things, but there's a lot of things you don't hear about that are really good kindnesses that people are doing for each other all over the world every day. That's just how I like to think about things. (laughs) Yeah, and that kind of goes without saying, but um, I think there's potentially a a deeper narrative there that there's way more low-paid people, workers of the world, than there are powerful people. So we want to control the masses and we keep them in a kind of constant state of fear with wars that go on or coronavirus coming out of China. There's epidemics of modern slavery in the world and people being trafficked all over the place for as cheap labor or as sex workers. Is this... Yeah. There's a constant narrative that prevails. No, I think there, there, there is a lot of that and there are a lot of bad things that go on, but I think it often gets obscured if we focus 100% on that, that there are good things to build on. Well, and I think that's sort of the definition of power. You're not going to have power if you don't have followers or you know people that are subject to you. And so I think power, you look at the big power players that they are selfish. Um, and so you're going to have this duality that goes with, okay, well, I'm going to have power. That means I have to have power over people. And so I need to make sure that they are doing what I want because I'm the one with the power. Whereas, you know, more of a cooperate cooperative relationship Mm -hmm. is not as self-serving. Um, Mm -hmm. and so there's definitely something to be said with this power complex and ruling by fear and why the two are so closely related. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty interesting because when I was watching the episode and I was thinking about ruling by fear, I was thinking about just like this small example on this ship, but yeah, you can definitely, that can get, definitely get you to think about the world at large and, and what can happen there. Well, and Faggio is so selfish Like everything has to be about him. And so it just goes hand in hand that he's like, you are going to perform for me. You're going to perform for my friends so that I can power over them and say, look how awesome and amazing I am because I have all these unique, you know, one of a kind items. And, and so it's very, very selfish. Is that kind of, I don't know if you have the phrase keeping up with the Joneses. Yes. Yeah. Do you? Okay. Um, I wasn't sure it was just a UK only thing. Um, but it's that kind of thing that Fajal has with his friend with his strange yeah. face jewelry. Um, mm-hmm. That, that has the jewelry like going into a hole in his face. And did you yes. notice he was picking his nose? He was nose? picking his nose when it wasn't, it wasn't focused on him. I he said, was like, what are you doing? <laughs> imagine there's going to be some kind of irritation when you wear that yeah. you know, type of extravagant jewelry. But yeah, he was trying to show off to this guy. And of course, by that point, Data is like, I'm just like not going to do anything and I'm going to embarrass this guy. It looks like a mannequin. (laughs) It doesn't look such (laughs) yet. Yeah, that... That, that that was pretty interesting to see. But yeah, like he he is trying to like one up other people and say, look what I got. You don't have a data. He's unique, you know. So it was pretty interesting. Well, let's talk about something I think you started to talk about a little bit, Amy, which is Jordy, because the whole it's not like the whole episode takes place on this the ship with Kivas Fajo and and Data. There's also back on the Enterprise, you know, they're thinking that that Data is dead and they're, you know, cleaning out his quarters and all that. But there's something that's bothering Jordy. And he, I, I was impressed by this as well. He's really persistent about it. He's like, 
I don't know. It's like, I can't find a cause. What's going on here? And he just finds like this little small thing in the audio like, okay, that's not an important thing to say, but Data said it the two times before and he always does. So something's going on. So it causes him to dig deeper in them to find out kind of what's really going on and put the pieces together once they're at the, at the on the planet. And I think it really speaks to their deep friendship and also what data evokes because Riker even says like for someone without emotions he sure evokes them in others and it's and I think that kind of gets to how the audience feels too like this is someone who's supposedly without emotions but data himself can evoke so many emotions in us and bring in Picard here like seeing data even if it's in a dream sequence in the first episode of Picard it can bring up all of these emotions like oh we're seeing data again so I found that really interesting to think about. And it's like, Jordy is such a good friend to to Data and really helps to save him in this. But let me get your guys' thoughts on that, Amy. You know, it was so interesting when Jordy and Wesley go into his quarters, you know, sort of to clear things out. And just the emotions, again, sorry to bring in Picard, but, you know, knowing, well, when we know in Nemesis that he dies, but, you know, they're going through this, and cleaning out and we see the painting that he does and that just, you know, brought in emotions of Picard oh, yeah. and stuff. And then, you know, they walk a little further and there's his violin and, you know, all of these things that Data is exploring his humanity. And then we get to his desk drawer and the things mm-hmm. that they pull out were the same things minus same one things from, the measure of man. from Measure of a Man where yeah. he has the Shakespeare book given to him by Picard um, then the cards and chips that they decide should go to Riker and how he always, you know, falls for Riker's bluffs. And then his, uh, awards, the highest honors from Starfleet and then his Tasha hologram. And mm-hmm. I'm like, they were pulling him out one by one. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was the exact same things minus the poker and the chips and the cards that data yeah. was packing when he was going to leave Starfleet. And I just, I loved that connection and again, seeing Picard and hearing about data, but I, it was very beautiful. Yeah, definitely. It, it, and it was pretty interesting because of course, as a viewer, you know, data is not dead, but for these characters, Jordy and Wesley, like he's gone and they're trying to reflect on it and, and it's sad, but, but they're also, it's bringing back happy memories like, oh, data at the poker games and, you know, he has all these medals and, and he's you know, done such great things for Starfleet and we're seeing his creativity and his paintings and how much he cared for Tasha and all of that. But I thought that was really beautifully done and really, it, it's kind of like it, it emphasizes the impact of it and spurs Jordy on to like go further. Like this, this can't be it. There has to be more, you know? So Joe, what do you think about, about that part of it and you know, what Jordy's doing? Do you know, there's something when they're, Jordy and Wesley are in Data's quarters into now and Wesley picks out the medals and says these are some of Starfleet's highest honours. And Jordy says something which just seems a little bit odd to me. He says, not bad for a walking pile of circuitry and memory cells. It just, it just boils it down to something simpler than data actually is. No, uh, but, but I, I, I took that not to be Jordy's personal opinion, but maybe what other people people's opinions of him would be like Bruce Maddox at the start of the measure of a man. Like, Oh, he's just like, you know, a pile of stuff that I need to experiment with. I think it, it's, it's almost like that's an argument against the people that would think that's all that he is. I don't think Jordy personally thinks that. Well, and one thing that I think is the theme throughout that is interspersed, like at that comment and, you know, Faggio tells data, you know, you're just an Android. And then at the end, you know, Data's like, no, I don't have those feelings. I'm just an android. Like, that's mm-hmm. continually hit, you know, just randomly. That So it's always in the back of your mind. Like, yeah, I don't have emotions. I don't, you know, I'm just an android. And I think that's just one little sly thing that is the theme throughout this episode. One one thing I noticed was that it totally makes sense that Jordy doesn't wear his visor when he's asleep. Oh, yeah. It's like uncomfortable. His- well, no, because like his visor would constantly send visual input to his brain, even though he's sleeping. Right. So, yeah. but, like he can't that's close true. his eyes. Yeah, right. no, that totally yeah. made sense. But wasn't he sleeping in his uniform also? Okay, can we talk that. about that square yeah. pillow? That <laughs> and who sleeps? I mean, yeah, maybe he was just taking a little nap. But your shoes are on. The 
that square pillow, how uncomfortable. I don't want to be in the 24th century because Star every Trek single bed that uncomfortable. I've seen And then is there's like the, the, tri- the triangular pillows too, right? Yeah, they're ridiculous. <laughs> mm. It reminds me of the, Min- I, I know it's not Star Trek, but in Babylon 5, the Minbari beds. And Minbaris don't sleep lying flat because it invites death, apparently, according to their culture. So they sleep at a, a weird kind of 45 degree angle. And humans struggle because they just end up sliding down to the bottom of the bed. Um, so, yeah, I suppose there's always going to be weird things about the future that we don't necessarily like. But rest assured, Amy, if you ever get the opportunity to go to the 24th century, you could always take your own pillows and okay, Egyptian I will. cotton sheets. Yeah. yeah, Star Trek pillows are interesting. Actually, I think the ones in Discovery look more uh, comfortable, right? Mm. They look like regular pillows. Amy's frowning. Yeah. <laughs> they look like more like regular pillows. They do. <laughs> But, you know, it was interesting when, you know, Jordy was delivering the Shakespeare book to, you know, Captain Picard in his ready room and Riker was there mm-hmm. and he's like, it just doesn't make sense. And, you know, again, this was just he's so angry. surprising where yeah. Picard's like, well, some things just don't and we have to accept them. And I'm like, what? What is going on? And, you know, Picard's like, you need to be rested a, because we have a mission to complete and, you know, help this planet and deliver the whatever. And B, you need to be on your game. And if, you know, so you go get some rest. And I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty but I think cold. Picard, but I think Picard did also say, like, let you can continue your investigation, but you need to get some rest first. And even Jordy's yeah. like, yeah, maybe I need to get a little rest before. But yeah, it did Ooh, seem like they were very just deflecting hesitant it a little to bit. Agree. Yeah. That look. Yeah. Where it's like, ooh. Because P- Picard just seems to accept it. Everybody else, for the most part, kind of doesn't accept it. And like Riker with Geordi, if it wasn't for Riker and Geordi, we'd never have found data. Because Riker doesn't believe it from the beginning. Yeah, because in his comment at the conference room, he's like, well, that's just amazing. We have the exact amount, even with the explosion. Like, yeah, yeah the, right place, uh, right so, time. But but like it, it's the combination of Jordy and the evidence they find on the planet. If it was just Jordy being persistent and like everything seemed perfectly fine on the planet, I don't know if they would have gone back. But then they were like, something fishy is going on here. Tell me about this Kivas Fajo. And it's like, oh, he likes to collect stuff. And maybe you that means data. So let's go here. back. But but it's because Jordy's pushing because, you know, maybe um, if they had just found something on the planet or if it was just Jordy, maybe it wouldn't have happened. But it was kind of the combination of it. But like, yeah, this is a pretty interesting episode to reflect on, like, Data's death. And maybe s- we got some reflection in Nemesis, but this is, like, a different kind of reflection, like, looking forward to that. And then in Picard, just, like, thinking about about Data and, like, the lingering impact that he would have and all that. So, well, let's talk about something I think that's a pretty interesting discussion. So we're going to the end of the episode. So, you know, throughout the episode... Um, Data is Fajo's prisoner, and and Fajo is trying to like increasingly like assert his will on Data, um, and and kind of you know one of the breaking points that that happens is that there's this Varan T disruptor, which apparently leads to an incredibly painful death. Well, actually, we see it later, um, and. Fajo is really trying to convince Data, like, you need to sit on that chair over there or I am going to disintegrate this person. And almost before he makes the threat, Data's sitting on the chair because he doesn't want to, to another life form to suffer because of him. But that causes the assistant to come back and help him to escape, and they're in the cargo bay and all of that. So, and and what ends up happening is that, uh, you know, his assistant, Vari, I think uh, Fajo feels betrayed and he disintegrates her in a very painful and horrible death um and it gets data to say like this this can't continue and he's aiming the disruptor at at fajo and then he's beamed away and then we find o'brien saying that it seems like the weapon had discharged in the transporter Riker asks him about that and he says well something must have occurred in transport and he leaves (laughs) so there is this question here was data actually going to kill and disintegrate Fajo. Well, I think it's obvious that he was because of what was found in the transporter beam. But I think the more interesting question was, did Data lie? Perhaps something occurred in the transport. N- no. Yeah. He knew that he fired. Mm. So I'm wondering, did Data lie? Yes. 
Yeah. Like, I, it's through, funny yeah. because I, I've often felt like, of course he did, and then he lied about it. But that's what I haven't liked about the episode before, that, that Data would get to that level. And I, and I try to think about, like, what actually gets him to that, that level. Like, because in his programming, he can't kill except in self-defense. So is it kind of like he's added a logical leap, like this is preemptive self-defense to keep other people from dying? This is complete logic. And as Faggio says, like, I'm just going to kill another person until you do what I say. Like, the steps are there and it's, you know, set up. Like we said before, Data's like, no, I only yeah. kill in defense. This is his defense. He cannot function. But does he have to kill F- Fajo? Um, I don't know. Maybe he does because does he still have the sh- the, that shield on him and he can't, like, come near him and, you know, knock him unconscious or something? So is the disruptor, like, his only yeah only thing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's interesting that Data recognizes Faggio's intelligence because Data, through the whole thing, I'm like, Data, why are you telling him? I'm going to try every means to escape. I'm going to, you know, and like Data keeps saying what he's going to do. He's not and saying anything Faggio doesn't know, exactly. but it's, it's his defiance. He in knows, it. yeah, he knows Faggio's smart enough. And so he's like, well, I'm going to, you know, try every method I can to escape. And so with Data trying every method and not being successful, like, this is the only way. I mean, I think Data has run the program of all the alternatives and ends up not being successful. So that this is complete self-defense. Mm. Joe, what do you think? There's a, an article that I read earlier um, with Shari Goodhart, who wrote the episode, and she recalls it being on the set with Brent Spiner and asking him if he think Data did fire intentionally, and Brent Spiner was adamant that, yes, Data did indeed fire the weapon at Fajo. Shari Goodhart mm-hmm. wanted it to be that way as well, that Data made a decision and followed it through, um, but the, the powers... Paramount at the time, they wanted it to be left more ambiguous, so the audience were. But it's not all that ambiguous, I think. Right. Well, you were questioning no. it because there would have to, but but there would have well, to be are, like coinc- <laughs> coincid- There would have to coincidentally be something that happened to cause it to discharge and transport without data doing that. That seems unlikely. Yeah, I think yeah. Th- so. you see data having. He said what well, he says something just before he possibly fires. He says, "I can't let you continue." Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Something um, like that. And then raises the, the disruptor and then gets beamed out. So I think the intent was definitely there to fire, mm-hmm. but he just got beamed out. So I think he's probably just firing as he get beams out, beamed mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Which is why but, you don't see the disruptor beam. But here, here's the, the, the question in my mind and something that's always bothered me about the episode. Is it really logical? Is it really in self-defense for him to cause another being to have a slow, painful death, no matter what that person has done, instead of trying, like, is he thinking that, oh, I'm going to, if I try different means of escape, then other people will die and that blood will be in my hands. But, but couldn't it also be the case that he would be like, this is a terrible situation. No one else needs to die. I need to just try to do what I can to lay low and just have faith that the enterprise will, will rescue me because I put my, like, okay, of course, really, like we're not in this real situation, but I, I, I just t- tend to think like I don't want to have to kill another being, another sentient being for any reason. So I wouldn't want to go to that level for any reason at all. But no, I yeah. think, like I said, Data has run the scenarios. There's no other way for him to stop Fagio. Like there is no other way. This is the only way. This is a defense. And of course, ironically, like they're, the Enterprise is right there, right? So he didn't actually have to. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know that, but... No. He, but, he yeah. thinks that the, the Enterprise thinks that he's dead. No one's looking for him. Like, this is his only chance because every other attempt he has made has failed. And he's run, in my opinion, every scenario. Like, mm-hmm. there's nothing... This is the only chance, which sort of goes to my question of why would he have to lie? Why wouldn't he divulge? Yes, I was shooting at him. Like, well, perhaps something occurred in transport. No, this was self-defense. This was the only, and he could totally have justified 
his actions. So I don't think that that lie was intended. But it's like a preemptive intended. self-defense. It's not like Faja was going to kill him in the moment. So they might define it differently. No, 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 no. I, I'm totally on board that it was defense. He's just seen Varia being horribly killed. And yeah. I think, like you say, and Amy, he he's run to this. Kill. Yes, everybody else. So Data's yep. thinking, what course of action is going to allow me to save the most number of people? And that action is to kill Fajo because Data doesn't know the Enterprise is right outside and about to yeah. beam him out. So he thinks, it's me. I'm the only yeah. person that could do anything about it. And I've got this weapon just now. So That's what I he's thinking, well. but I, I don't agree with his logic. Well, and I think it's interesting, Joe, that you um, said that about Brent Spiner and the writer, because I think maybe that line, perhaps something occurred in transport, was put there to add the ambiguity. But mm. to me, it reads just as a lie. And that's the weird part that I don't like about the episode. I don't in any way, shape or form have any doubts as to that he did it and the reasons. And I'm totally on board with mm. it. But you know what would have been, I think what weird. would have been a more interesting choice and actually made it more ambiguous was would be not to have the line that the weapon was just charging in transport, but it looks like he's about to fire and they beam him away and you don't know whether he was actually going to do it or not. There's not like a discharge, but it seems like maybe in the next second or so he's going to do it or maybe not. And you don't know. I would have actually liked that better because then you could say it's more ambiguous and what would really push him to do that. But they make it clear, I think from that line that like, that's what he was doing. That's what yeah. I love about it, that they went that far. All you have to say though is, oh yeah, I was trying to escape and I got into a firefight. Wow. Easy. Fagio was, did not have a weapon. Yeah. So like what I've always had a problem with though, is, is data actually like making the decision to use this disruptor and like painfully disintegrate someone. And I just think about like, it's a totally different situation, but a contrast like, um, like Picard and who watches the watchers who's willing to sacrifice his own life so that these people don't have this belief or that all of these things don't happen. So like, wh like if, why is it that data isn't more willing to, to go along with this or possibly even sacrifice his own life than have to, to kill someone else? I don't know. It, it just feels not right for his character because someone's not like firing at him in the moment. But Well, I don't think that he can, you know, well, why don't you stay here while I go get a, a different weapon so that I can stun you and not kill you? Like there's no way for him to contain him. And with, you know, his other ship, mates or you know Faggio's other croons they might be coming down like we okay. there is essence of time going on here as well well we'll just disagree about this because yes. I find it just but but like what what I think it says actually is that something in data has actually overridden like his logic or his programming to take him to a point where he's willing to do that because I don't think it's actually consistent with the with the way he was programmed that's yeah, we will disagree on that it. because okay. I think it's every <laughs> bit logical that he's run the scenarios and that this is the only way that he has that will be successful to escape and to save lives. It's that ph philosophy question. You're on a train and you can change the train to go down one or two tracks and then one track there's a baby and there's another track there's 10 adults. What, what does a computer, an AI decide to do? Kill the 10 adults or kill the baby? It's that kind of logic scenario. There's no... There's no good answer. Somebody's going to die. So it's like what Faggio says, like you need to decide which of the worst choices you're going to do when he's disintegrating his uniform. You know, I think okay. that that is a precursor to what happens at the end of the episode. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll disagree somewhat on that, but I think we've had a really great discussion. So let's go into our final thoughts. Joe, you want to start? I would like 100 denkiers of phenoplac, please. Yeah, no. Really, Don't drink it. Don't drink no. it. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it wouldn't harm his skin. So does that mean it wouldn't harm like normal organic skin? But when he, when he the first time I saw the episode and he got it from the replicator, I was like, oh, that's interesting. He's going to drink something. <laughs> like, I was like, yes, oh, no. Nope. I think, I think yeah. we all thought that. I had to look up the spelling and the, so I could say it right, phenoplac and denkiers. I wonder what a denkier is. What, 100 mils maybe? Interesting. Anyways, I yes, I have always enjoyed this episode, um, both of The Most Toys and of Earl Grey. It was an interesting discussion. Um, and as usual, it gets into some kind of philosophy discussion and 
and uh, talking about characters' motivations when we don't have any definitive answers for things. Love the way Saul Rubinek plays it. And I've seen Saul Rubinek in so many things, like the the caretaker of the warehouse in Warehouse 13. I think that's my favourite thing that he's in. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Okay, great. Uh, Amy, your final thoughts? So can we have a little math moment? Oh, yes, we haven't had it's one of those for a little while. It's been a while. I know, listeners, I'm so sorry. But I found it very... Very interesting, and it sort of changed the way I saw the episode just a little bit. Um, because normally, when you are searching for someone, and so Wesley and they're you know around because they're trying to locate uh, Faggio's ship, and they're like, Okay, well, this is where he was this many hours, and this is how fast. So then we have this search area, but it says they say perimeter. perimeter. And I thought, wow, that totally limits what they have to search. If the ship is on the perimeter, then all they have to do is search the perimeter and not the entire area, which totally Mm -hmm. makes sense. And look at the perimeter and what would be, you know, where might he go within that perimeter? And I just loved that for a little math moment. (laughs) I read that differently. Okay. I don't know if it was a... A mistake in the dialogue or the script, but I think they mixed up the term perimeter with like a volume because it's three dimensional space. Oh, like so a surface it would give area. You, oh no, no yeah, like uh, uh, what am I thinking of? No, the radius. Yeah. Was one point three light years, and not the perimeter was one point three light years. I think he could have travelled one point three light years from where he started to where he went to in this amount of time, travelling at a maximum of warp three. And so that radius gives you a spherical volume of like four thirds pi r cubed, where r yes. is one point three light years. So yeah, so with them saying perimeter, then that is a two-dimensional versus surface area three-dimensional. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. But I, I still found it interesting that they didn't say area slash volume because then that mm. would increase their search the parameters. Yes, whereas exactly. now we're just searching the perimeter slash surface area. Yeah, it's funny. I was watching that and I was like, yeah, they're searching for him and he's not far away. But I oh, love that you yeah. guys go deeper into it. <laughs> yeah. We had I'm like, oh, they're going to find him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this episode, like I said at the beginning, really highlights, you know, this question of morality because we have, you know, Data who is so moral and Faggio who is so not moral. And the the logicalness of both of them, and I think you summed it up great, Justin, at the beginning where it's like, yeah, you have a goal, you have, you know, this motives and what you want to accomplish, and then there's morality, and then there's logic. So to have those three makes a great person, and if any one of those is missing, then we end up with someone like Faggio. Um, I love the debate and the leadership style that we get to analyze with Faggio and, and contrast that, you know, to so many of our beloved characters like Jordy with his perseverance and how he's, you know, rallying the troops and how Picard's like, well, we have to finish this mission and then we can continue. Like, there's so many different leadership styles that we can compare and contrast to. And this is just another great episode. And yeah, so good. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed watching the episode and the conversations. Of course, we disagreed on some things, but I think it brings up a lot of great questions. And we were talking about political questions and moral questions and philosophical questions. So it's always great when we can talk about those things. But we were also able to talk about things on a smaller scale, like what was going on with Fajo, what was going on with Data, what Jordy was doing in the episode. So I, I love when that happens and it often happens in Star Trek where you can follow like here are the characters, here are their motivations and what they're doing, but also it brings up this wider question that like is outside the boundaries of of Star Trek where we bring it into our own world. So I really love doing that. And as you said, um, I think early on, Amy, this also makes you think of what we see of Data and Picard, which is just like a dream sequence so far. But Data gets heavily referenced in the episode as well. And basically, Picard is defending Data in that episode remembrance and talking to Dodge to inspire her like for what Data did and who he was. So, And you see that also reflected in Jordy and Wesley, just like 
finding all of these things in his quarters and basically how inspiring of a sentient being that he is. So it's a really great reflection on that, but also how far can someone get pushed until they might take an action that they normally wouldn't do. So I think it's, it's a, it's a pretty thought provoking episode and listeners, you'll have to let us know what you think. I'm just going to say I called um, who Daj was at a feeling of the Daj link way long ago. Do, do you have proof of that? I called it too. I, don't, I think we're I don't, all saying I just, it. she reminded me, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, I can't say that, spoiler alert. We're spoiling alert. stuff anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, she reminded me of Lal. Yeah. There was something very Lal about her. Her yeah, skin was way too perfect anyway. Let, let's keep watching the show because I think the Lal connection is different than you might think. But anyway. I think that Agnes woman is a baddie. <laughs> I think she's part of like a human isolationist movement and I think she reprogrammed the synths to destroy the, the rescue fleet and blow up Utopia Planitia. I think okay. This has been Joe's speculation minute mm-hmm. about Star I, that's Trek it, It's on record now. Okay, cool. Uh, so Joe, you want to tell us about next week's episode? Yes, so next week we've got a really super special guest in the form of Dr. Erin MacDonald who is like super famous. She's an astrophysicist. Um, she is a Star Trek science consultant and she loves Star Trek as well. And if you were lucky enough to go to Star Trek Las Vegas last year, you might have seen one of the talks that she gave on the science in Star Trek. So on Earl Grey, we will be continuing our science and TNG discussion with Erin McDonald to put all our science inaccuracies right. I am Ooh. so looking forward to mm-hmm. this. Me I too. love our science episodes, but now we have Dr. Aaron McDonald. An actual Woo. scientist. Yeah, yes. not just yeah, me. And yeah. So, and, and, it, and it was fairly recent that she was named a, a science consultant for Star That's Trek. Right, so yeah. I think she's doing some consulting for Picard, right, at the very least? I, th- I think I heard it was Star Trek Online, wasn't or something? Oh, okay. Well, we'll find out. But anyway, it's 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 very exciting, and um, you helped to bring this guest to us because you met her at Destination Star Trek, right? Uh, no, I met, or was it at met her at oh, Vegas. Oh, it was Vegas. Yeah, she. Was, I saw caught her talk. I noticed that she had a salt tire, a Scotland flag tattoo, uh, oh. and I thought, I don't want to ask you about science. I want to ask you about that tattoo. You've got an American accent. Why do you have a Scotland tattoo? See, you've already got a Scottish connection before we even interview her. Yes, <laughs> she has the most Scottish name. Ever, but she's an American. Yeah. Um, and it happens that she went to Glasgow University for a time oh, wow. and studied. So Very, Excellent. very cool. Well, listeners, you can look forward to that. I think that's going to be a great episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's been so much fun talking about the most toys, but that isn't the only thing we've been talking about here on the network. Here's what you might have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Line, a Star Trek Picard podcast. A concern that a lot of people brought up was that when you see Utopia Planitia, there's several Discovery era ships that you see there. I, I don't and understand how people can have a problem with that. But I let's talk about understand. it a little bit. Be- because how you're... long was the Excelsior class around for? <laughs> yeah, that's 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 my point as well. There's also a TOS shuttle in Generations in the 24th century, mm-hmm. and a bunch. And there could be like a story reason for that, right? Earl Grey. There's one point that annoys me, and it's the. The trans using the transporter to reverse the whole thing, <laughs> and they find a, yeah. a hair on her brush that's in the like. Why would you keep your hairbrush in the back of the second drawer down? I don't know. I'm sure people do it today. No, I I'm keep sure. my hairbrush in a drawer. <laughs> in the back of the second drawer down, though. Like she's got like eight eight there drawers. There may be items more important in the top drawer. So Joe, oh. you're worried about like the, the drawer placement the and the part of the drawer? <laughs> I love that. Primitive Culture. A look at history and culture through Star Trek. You can go back and you can see a lot of the familiar arguments um, that we associate with modern Star Trek fandom playing out in fandom in real time in the 90s through fanzines like Cinefantastique, for example. And what happens during the second season, if you read the interviews on various episodes, is that you see writers and people working on the show using the magazine in order to advance their own narrative of the production of Voyager. Standard Orbit. 
the season as a whole is just this tremendous journey. It's a roller coaster that uh, when you get to Operation Annihilate takes a very sharp drop very suddenly, <laughs> but at least it's over very quickly. But like as it goes, you're ramping up and up and up and up, and it's just it's it's amazing to watch in those terms. So that would probably be why it would be maybe my fourth favorite Star Trek season ever. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad or Apple TV or the desktop Apple Podcasts app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review that helps others to find the show. All right, guys, you ready for some Mad Libs? Oh, yeah, Mad we're going to do, do Mad Libs again, listeners. This time Amy's doing it so I can participate. <laughs> yes, because I feel that Justin kept giving us a hard time. Pick better words. No, I'm just And kidding. just so you know, I'm going to take all of my choices from the AI written TNG script that we uh, read before. Oh. Excellent. Cop out. Okay, uh, so. Creative. <laughs> yeah, very creative. All right, well, let's get started with. Uh, Joe, will you give me an adjective? That's a describey word, isn't it? Yes, um, it is. Mm. Gargantuan. Mm. You're asking me to spell now. Okay, <laughs> Justin. A place. A place. A big circle with a porch. <laughs> I wonder what that is. It's our lovely Enterprise D. Ah. Uh, B A G. Joe, I'm spelling a big circle with a porch for you, Amy. Thank you, <laughs> Joe. I need a noun. A noun. Oh, a noun. Hmm. Turbo lift. Justin, I need a verb. A verb. Not as many funny verbs in this. <laughs> uh, let me see. Emit. Joe, another mm. adjective. Another adjective. Um, blazing. Does blazing work? An adjective. Yeah. Yeah, I okay. think so. Justin, plural noun. Big things of chips. <laughs> Joe, noun. A noun. Mm, a noun. Sonic shower. Hmm. Nice. Justin, adjective. It's a describing word. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> An adjective. Uh, let's see here. Attractive. Thank you, Justin. You're just talking to me. <laughs> I'm talking to Amy and the puzzle. Yeah. Oh, fine. Noun. Joe, noun. A noun. Is that the describing one? No. Noun. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um Potted plant, like what, the one in the corridor? Justin, adjective? Oh, so many adjectives. Um, let's see. Elaborate. That's Joe, a, good one. a noun. A noun. Um, bat left. I wanted that big black seat that ha um, Worf has in his quarters. You know, the big thing with the arms and the balls on top. That looks like such an uncomfortable chair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Justin, plural noun. Self-replicating dances. <laughs> Is that a noun? I That's don't a noun -ish. think so. Ish, ish. Dances. Oh, um, Is that fine. a verb? Let me pick another. It's a, it's a, well, yeah, dance, dance is a, a noun, oh. but is but that? it's a particular kind of dance, right? Okay. The noun is self-replicating dance. No, self-replicating is an adjective because it's no. describing dance. Yeah, but but like a dance as a noun is different than. Okay, oh, I'm keeping it. Fine. I'm keeping it. <laughs> um. Okay, Joe. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Please don't ask for a subjunctive preposition because I don't know any of those. Oh. Amy's bringing out her light. There is one light. There is one light. Joe, you need to name a person. In the room. Cooper. A dog person. He's right here. Hi, Cooper. <laughs> Hi, Cooper Poops. All right, Justin, a noun. A noun. Let's see. Uh, 
rock. Joe, adjective. Mm -hmm. Adjective. I'm rough. I've run out of adjectives. You know, I went to school in the 70s and 80s in Scotland. And Did grammar. they not have adjectives back then? <laughs> no, they didn't. But I've since discovered that, um, like, English and, like, grammar and all these rules um, weren't a priority. So, like, they were pretty much missed out of my education. So I've had to teach myself since. And I'm like, I've, I have to... That's why I say... I hear the word adjective, and I think, oh, that's a describing word, describing isn't it? Describing word, yeah. Yeah. Um, I struggle. I hate this game. Um, adjective. I can't think of any adjectives. Curly. No. Um, okay. Sickly. Straight. Sickly. sickly. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Justin, another adjective. Adjective. Hmm. Let's see. It's really difficult. Does this qualify? Pretty good? Yeah. Oh okay. my gosh, that's funny. Sorry, I read the... No <laughs> All right. Uh, Joe, your last one, so make it good. A verb. Mm -hmm. A verb. A verb? A verb. Or a Action verb. Action word. I know. I was just doing it in your accent. A verb? Or a verb? That's not <laughs> how Amy sounds. <laughs> a verb? <laughs> um, or a verb. A doing. A doing. A verb. A that's doing Joe's what? accent. Verb? Uh, that's, that's closer than Joe you've ever either, been. But <laughs> that's the closest she's ever been. Um, <laughs> can I make holodeck a verb? Is there a way to make holodeck a verb? Yeah, let's go like holodeck. Ho holodecking? holodecking? Holodecking, yes. What are, you, okay. what are you doing at the weekend? I'm holodecking. Mm. Okay. I'm sure. All right, uh, Justin, your last noun. A noun? Laser scanner. I think we should change it next time to include sounds. Joe, a sound. Pew! <laughs> That'd be funny. We're just living by the rules in the <laughs> yeah. book. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, listeners, okay. if you're playing along, uh, we are, the title of this is called The Kobayashi Maru. All right. I'm sorry, I'm having eye difficulties, so I have my magnifying glass and my readers on. I went to the eye doctor and we're going to try something new, but I'm, anyways. Okay. Okay. The most gargant gargantuan. 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 Okay. The most gargantuan challenge you will encounter in your training at Starfleet, a big circle with a porch, is <laughs> the Kobayashi Maru. This turbo lift will test your ability to emit under pressure and make blazing decisions. All big things of chips who want to be in command <laughs> must take this dreaded sonic shower. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh no. They're coming naked to the Kobayashi Maru to Ooh. take a shower, maybe? Mm, the frequency That totally high. fits in with, you know, you think you're that and a bag of chips. I love it. <laughs> the attractive vessel, Kobayashi Maru, is stranded in the Klingon neutral plotted plant. <laughs> Neutral potted plant, yeah. Cadets must decide whether to leave the elaborate ci ci civilians to certain death or attempt a rescue which would endanger their own batleth and the lives of all the crew members. <laughs> Either way, everyone ends up blown to self-replicating dances. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the only person to ever defeat the Kobayashi Maru was Cooper. Who reprogrammed oh. the rock so that the text could be beaten. Many consider this solution to be sickly, but <laughs> that cadet received commendations for pretty good thinking. Most cadets holodecking the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> That's great. How would you do in this no-win laser scanner? All right. Nice. Mm. I like it. Yes. Let's go holodecking. I Lights. like it. That's that's a sounds. new verb. That sounds good. Like you know how people say, like, let's go clubbing, they'll go out to a dance. Let's go holodecking and yeah. just go and whatever stuff that happens in a holodeck. Yeah. Yeah. And it totally Stays makes sense because the Kobayashi Maru is a program, so Yeah. We need the holodeck Kobayashi Maru. All right. Well that was fun. Um now back to our script. 
If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, YouTube, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. And, you know, if you want to just send us your feedback in the form of a Mad Lib, please go ahead. We'll try to interpret it. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Earl Grey. That will come right to us, and we might read your email on the show. You can also find the network on Twitter and Instagram at TrekFM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash TrekFM. So, Amy, where can people contact you when you're not collecting rare things? Well, when I'm not doing that. Hopefully not enslaving people when you're doing it. (laughs) Yeah, no. Uh, You can find me over on United Federation of Podcasts doing a little show called All Good Things. You can find me on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson, and you can find me right here in the Babel Conference. And Justin, when can people contact you when you are choosing not to fire a disruptor and cause immortal pain? Wow, there was a lot going on there. Immortal pain? That sounds like pain that lasts forever. Oh. Well, those disruptors, uh, they, yeah, it was pretty terrible. Immortal until you die. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. In TNG, we see some really like painful deaths. There's also the one in um, Loud as a Whisper where the chorus, like yes, you see their bones and then similar. they disintegrate and like, ah. So there's some nasty weapons out there in the 24th century. So when I'm not firing one of those, which I really don't ever want to. Um, so when I'm not doing that, you can find me co-hosting The Line. That's our Star Trek Picard podcast with my friends, Brandon Chamatal and Chrissy DeClerc Zalagi. We are into the episodes of Picard. So as we're recording this, we did one for episode one. We're going to do one every week and hopefully coming out a couple days after each episode airs. So that's been really exciting. Uh, You can find me on Twitter. I'm at TrekFan4747 where I tweet about nothing but Star Trek. And you can find me hanging around the Babel Conference on Facebook. So Joe, where can people contact you when you're not furiously holodecking? Oh, see, do you know what? See, if I had a holodeck, I would furiously holodeck like (laughs) every day. Um, yeah, that would be let's my not jam. get into the details of what goes on in that holodeck, though. Oh, it'd be fun stuff. It'd be like space no simulation. No sonic showers. But, but it would be um, like space battle simulations. Oh, okay. It'd be really cool. Amazing. Okay. Um, so when I'm not doing that, you can get me on the Babel Conference. You can tweet me on the Twitter at joeyjoe77uk. Or sadly, you can email me but nobody does are people still not emailing you come on no, listeners send an email to joepodcast just, at gmail.com just he reach will be out very and say very hi. sad otherwise it'll be very I'm, sad yeah please just just type out an email and say hi joe and then you'll get it started I send yeah joepodcasts at gmail.com please <laughs> well if you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week you can become a patron of the network on patreon visit patreon.com slash trek fm that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Trek FM to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take this opportunity to recognize our current associate producers, Norman Lau, Michael Huter, Thomas Appel, Chris Trebuzio, Jim McMahon, Joe Keegan, and me, Justin Ozer. Thank you for supporting Trek FM and especially Earl Grey. So join us next time for another cup of Earl Grey. I would like to wish everybody a happy Burns Day around the world. This is To a Mouse by Robert Burns, who is the Scottish bard and was born in 1769. We sleek it cowering timorous beastie, oh what a panics in thy breastie, thou need a star a wa sae hasty, wi bickering brattle, I wad be lave to run and chase thee, wi murdering paddle. Great joy and gratitude. Perhaps something occurred during transport, Commander. 